this baseball show that the um, that the baseball reliquary has put together has brought some epic fans out of the woodwork. And I have to say something about this. Because about 10 years ago when, when Beirut got bombed really badly, a lot of people said, we have to do something. We have to do something. So a friend of mine and I, Serene Balian and I, put, was try, were trying to put together an anthology of poems for Beirut. And we got like five submissions, OK? What does this have to do with baseball? I started talking about putting together a baseball poetry reading. And a lot of people, instead of saying, no, we have to do this, a lot of people went, baseball? I'm not a big fan of organized sports. I just don't know. I'm not sure. And then I got something like 70 poems sent to me in the mail. So we're probably going to be doing more than two of these, ultimately. It is apparently a hugely unifying thing. And um, I kind of thought it was funny. Now, we almost got to start this baseball poetry reading <clears throat> with the Shel Silverstein poem, but I decided against it. <laughs> because I don't really want to make it into a joke. So we're going to start really easy. I do have poems written about other baseball things, but I don't want to suck up all the air, although I'm going to be doing a lot of that tonight. So I thought I'd read this, which is basically just a love poem to my partner. It's called Summer Invocation, and it's not quite a baseball poem. Play catch with me. Let's drag out the old gloves. Mine a mold of decades gone version of this hand. Healing percussion of a ball, a rhythm, a known weight and size. Play catch with me. Sweet polished leather conjuring afternoons out back with grandma pulling weeds, the transistor sputter of Giants games and then maybe half an hour of toss and thud, her lazy and perfect gesture, the ball quick, here in the midsummer hill fog, play catch with me, and draw the spirits of baseball ghosts whispering possibility, singing songs of grace and ungrace, surprise and striving. When the day is too perfect for the usual, we can fall into a whisper of baseball float on a memory of baseball or something close, walking past the stories of Seal Stadium, the vibrations catch me in their unfaded spectacle as we drive past Kizar from the airport along the Bay Edge where candlestick birds still flock. Love me in this year and season. Play catch with me. I'm one of those people that my relationship to baseball was watching TV with my dad while he chain smoked cigarettes and drank a Coke and flipped through Time magazine and made origami. <laughs> so, but I wrote a poem that's uh, related to a game of color. Um, this is about the all Japanese American Nisei League. The difference between baseball and sumo. Too bad my grandpa didn't love baseball instead of sumo. But no. He loved Japanese wrestling so much he started a sumo club in Stockton, long before Fat City or Cage Wrestling put Stockton on the He-Man's map. In the 1930s, when the FBI was making its lists, my grandpa was classified as a potentially dangerous enemy alien. Arrested after Pearl Harbor because of religion, Buddhism, and martial arts. Sumo as a martial art? Can you imagine the invasion of the giant sumotori? coming to sit on us and force feed us huge bowls of ramen. <laughs> on the other side of the family, my widowed grandma could care less about sports. Maybe if she had made her son play ball, she could have hung on to her farm like the, Ike the Ikedas did. 
Charles Ikeda's dad was such a baseball fan that he started a Nisei League team in 1931. Those Japanese Americans were so good, they caught the eye of Vard Loomis, who was a star pitcher at Stanford for a while. He coached the team to tournament victory all up and down the West Coast. When the Ikedas were sent to camp, Vard took care of their farm so they could return after the war. Today, there is no more sumo in Stockton, and my grandma's farm is long gone. But Ikeda Farms is still going strong, and Vard Loomis Lane runs right alongside. So, the real American game. It used to be that real men didn't eat quiche. Real men played baseball and ate apple pie and freedom fries. Baseball just hasn't been the same since they let in players from S-hole countries and even J-holes that bombed P Harbor. Now real men, sorry, now real men can't eat sushi or burritos or falafel. But we still got the all-American Frank in a bun. What do you mean Frankfurter is German? In hamburger, too? Also from that pee-whip country run by a sea? Clean up your language like the commander in chief. It's hot dog and burger. The US of A is for a-holes like me. So this uh, poem that I is all about the uh, what I know about the Negro Baseball League, and it's called "They Had Their Say." They never wanted me to take up their space, figuring I should stay in my place. Their ballpark was no place for me to be, nor for any dark-skinned savage like me. They had made it clear that I was to stay where boys of my hue were supposed to play. They were the hunters. I was the prey. But I took up the challenge anyway. And though they didn't think that I would dare to play, still, I knocked it out of the park that day. Little did they think that it would go that way, that I'd summon the courage sufficient to play. And though I knew I'd have the devil to pay, still, I stood tall behind the plate that day. And despite all the odds against me that day, I threw a no-hitter anyway. They didn't think that I could make the play but I ran the bases with uncommon speed that day. Robinson, Campanella, Newcomb, Doby, Page, each in turn had his say. And when finally given the chance to play, they performed with honor and grace that day. A homer, a no-hitter, superior behind the plate, play. They accomplished all three in their own way. Not for the crowds in attendance that day, but for the young men who would follow their way. No, not for personal fame nor glory. It was for mankind's sake that they wrote their story, that they summoned the grace and strength to play and against all odds succeeded that day. Yes, they each succeeded in his own way and gave a gift to humanity that day. For once and for all, they had their say, and mankind grew a lot that day. Wow. 
I won't be the first person to have an existential crisis about baseball. Since we moved to San Francisco, my brother Dan used to meet me at least once a year to watch the Astros and the Giants play. See, we were in a win-win situation. So we picked our seats way up in the stands, right over right field, for the view of the bay, for the kayakers who field the bay balls, for the proximity to the craft beer bar, and for the sparseness of the crowd up there, because we are respectful. And we know that no one else will be happy if the Strohs win. We're respectful, so we play the game that everybody wins. My brother's lanky frame easily hides two tall boys in the inside pockets of his camping jacket. We're not rich, and we can rationalize because cheap beer tastes better when it costs less and somebody lets you sneak it in. But we're respectful. We play the game that everybody wins. So we buy some craft beer for the cup and refill with delicious swill, usually around the second inning. We cheer for every hit and every run and every perfect play either way because we're in a win-win situation. Me and Dan can talk for hours, and when the cans are empty, I buy you fly, little brother. Seagull circle and Dan swoops into our row with a couple more classy brown beers. This ain't no dome foam, oh no. And we quietly cheer every time anyone scores or makes a great play. For us, the Astros and Giants is not so much competition as ballet. It's a win-win situation. We play by the rules. We root, root, root for the home team, like the song says, the new home, the old home. Then someone, somewhere, decided to move the Astros to the American League. <laughs> My brother keeps trying to explain the details, and I still can't understand it. A fog rolls into my mind, a chilly, willful ignorance, cold as fingers around cold beer in the cold sun on a cold day where the Astros and the Giants used to play. <laughs> you know, it's just not the same. It's just not the same. And now they play like the Rangers and the A's, and it's like, that's just weird. Like, I don't even understand what that means. Anyway, um, and the Astrodome has its own weather. No one escapes Texas stereotypes. People always interrogate my lack of hick accent, backward politics, and family ranch, but they never ask me about baseball. It's not in the stereotypes DNA. The Astros are our team. The cheap seats where dad liked to sit is in the bleachers way, way out in the depths of left field and in the gray layer of the Astrodome where nobody liked to sit, halfway up the orange rainbow. The eighth wonder still wears an internal jersey layer by layer stadium seats monochromed to match the home team, except the gray layer. Tickets were cheap or free for school groups, scouts and such. Maybe because its failure to orange dampened your feelings about whatever you were witnessing. In the gray layer, a grand slam home run earns some applause. And it occurs to you that there won't be a line for the bathroom right now as the pigeons and the grackle swirl in the wispy clouds that always form just before it rains inside. <laughs> Thanks, y'all. When I first moved here, I you know, came from the East Coast. We were all uh, Oriole fans growing up in the East Coast. So I didn't even have to change colors coming out of here. It's orange and black. It just kept the same clothes. It was pretty nice. And the uh, old sportscaster for the uh, Orioles was John Miller when we were listening. And he and I both moved out the same year, which was kind of great. So I'd get, uh, get on my bike. Couldn't really afford anything. Still can't afford anything. 
But uh, I'd uh, get on the bike and then ride down to the stick for an afternoon game. Four bucks, sit in the bleachers, work on poems, watch home runs. Kind of awesome. One of the best things that happened recently was, uh, you know those big signs at the ballpark that say, like, Section 202? Uh, two weeks ago, I took them all down at the ballpark, and I'm going to put them all up. I really changed sponsors or something. But it's something really neat about being in the ballpark by yourself. Just me and the other guy are just wandering around the baseball park. We're like, this is our place now. It's kind of neat. Love the Giants. It didn't take long for me to love the Giants coming here. So this little ode to Romo. To Sergio Romo is a, a pitcher for the Giants. He's now, I think he's a Ranger or something, who or a Tampa Bay Ray, I don't know. But Romo's jersey hangs over the bar in San Francisco because he was Romo. I mean, he's still Romo. But yo, when he was Romo, he was Romo. Nobody remembers the red except the internet, but he was killing us. In fact, the reds were killing us. Giant killers they were. First round of the playoffs and they swept us at home and that guy, whoever he was, was a big part of it. The giants flew off to Ohio no one expecting a return in any meaningful way until next spring. Baseball is a trap, a game, masquerading as a sport where the best athletes have combinations of skills that don't necessarily correlate. Me, I can hit. I can watch the ball onto the bat and over the shortstop's head. As an adult, you're playing slow pitch, but still, it's a skill. And I can catch anything because probably I won't get out of the way. But still, the most important part of the game, which makes baseball baseball, is you have to be able to throw. And you would think that someone who can hit arm strength, hand-eye coordination, should, through arm strength and hand-eye coordination, be able to throw. No, I can't throw. I'm no Romo. The Giants took a game from the Reds and then somehow gutted out a pitcher's duel to tie the series, which left a game five to decide, which was scheduled during the day because I guess nobody thought it would go that far anyway. It was overcast on a day when everyone had to work. So it wasn't like anyone was home watching the game or in a pub but you could see them walking around Soma, staring at their phones, walking into traffic, into newspaper boxes and into each other. I skeeved off work and stepped into the tempest to see on the big screen, Sergio Romo facing this red, this big red. And you were glad that it wasn't a wrestling match or a gladiatorial struggle because the Red's arms were huge. In hand-to-hand -hand combat, he could have grabbed Romo by both arms and pulled them both out of the socket. And up against this guy, Romo, our Romo, skinny Sergio, only had two pitches, a fastball and a slider. But he can't throw the fastball because this guy destroys fastballs. So Romo throws a slider, and the red monster fouls it off. He throws another slider, and he fouls it off. Time and again, slider, slider. Time and again, foul, foul. And he lets some go by that miss the strike zone. So now it's a full count. Three and two, and Romo throws another slider, and everyone gets nervous. Will Romo lose patience? Will he throw the fastball? Will this guy crush it into Kentucky or Lake Erie or China? But he keeps it up. Slider, foul. Slider, foul. And the world just stops. 
All the streetlights in San Francisco turn red. Satellites overhead hover instead of orbit. The ocean stills, forgetting waves and tides. And Romo throws a slider. And this guy fouls it off. Something had to give. And in my memory, it was a hundred pitches. Until the red, with the tree trunk arms, struck out his bat carving home plate in half. But the internet said, Jay Bruce, that was his name, popped out instead. <laughs> Which might, in retrospect, seem appropriate. It was when sport turned into mind game that any chess master could understand. With the implacable Romo facing the irresistible force, no words do it justice. No videotape can replace that moment. And Romo, Romo will grow larger and larger. Remember when Romo cured cancer? Remember when Romo won the Cold War? Remember when Romo wrestled a bear and an alligator at the same time? No? I don't remember any of these things either. But he did throw a slider. And in that place, at that time, it was the best thing to do. And do, and do, and do, and do and do, and do, and do, and do, and do. Thank you. Lawrence, you know, he's going to be 99 in a couple of weeks, and his eyes are gone, and he can't really see very well. And Kim wanted him to appear, and then she suggested that he, he had a baseball canto, and it's, it's a really good poem, a good political poem, too. and. Uh, so I said I would do it. She asked me, and I said, of course, I'll do it. And so I'll read that, and then I'll read my own, uh, well, I'll tell you a little about it after I get done with Lawrence. Is it OK? It's called The Baseball Canto, and it's in this latest book of his called Greatest Poems. Watching baseball, sitting in the sun, eating popcorn, reading Ezra Pound, and wishing one marechal would hit a hole right through the Anglo-Saxon tradition in the first canto, and demolish the barbarian invaders when the San Francisco Giants take the field and everybody stands up to the national anthem with some Irish tenor's voice piped over the loudspeakers, were all the players struck dead in their places, and the white umpires, like Irish cops in their black suits and little black caps, pressed over their hearts, standing straight and still, like at some funeral of a Blarney bartender, and all facing east, as if expecting some great white hope or the Founding Fathers to appear on the horizon like 1066 or 1776 or all that, but all that, but Willie Mays appears instead in the bottom of the first and a roar goes up as he clouts the first one into the sun and takes off like a footrunner from Thebes, the ball is lost in the sun, and maidens wail after him, but he keeps a running through the Anglo-Saxon epic, and Tito Fuentes comes up, looking like a bullfighter in his tight pants and small paint pointed shoes, and the right field bleachers go mad with Chicanos and Blacks and Brooklyn beer drinkers. Sweet Tito, sock it to him, sweet Tito. And sweet Tito puts his foot in the bucket and smacks one that don't come back at all and flees around the bases like he's escaping from the United Fruit Company 
as the gringo dollar beats out the pound and sweet Tito beats it out like he's beating out usury, out to, not to mention fascism and anti-Semitism, and Juan Marichal comes up, and the Chicano bleaches go loco again as Juan belts the first fastball out of sight and rounds first and keeps going and rounds second and rounds third and keeps going and hits pay dirt to the roars of the grungy populace as some nut presses the backstage panic button for the tape-recorded national anthem again to save the situation, but it don't stop nobody this time in their revolution round the loaded white bases in this last of the great Anglo-Saxon epics in the Territorio Libre of baseball. Yeah. <laughs> Do you, uh, do you need me to read uh, with a microphone to do what you have to do? I have to? Okay. Oh. All right. <laughs> okay. Uh, there are certain things that about baseball that I'm very proud of. I'm an old guy. You know, nobody loves me anymore, more and more. I'm 84, an old man of 84, full four. four. But I was at the Yankee Stadium when Lou Gehrig made his final speech. My father took pictures of it, said there wasn't a dry eye in 161,000 people. Lou was more beloved in New York than, than Babe Ruth even, because he was from New York, and he was the only one of the Yankees at that time who was a college graduate. He'd gone to Columbia. Uh, on the other hand, Having come from a Jewish-Italian neighborhood in the Bronx, the family, my family, naturally wanted me to vote for the Detroit Tigers because Hank Greenberg was two blocks away. That's where he was born and grown up. But I liked Hank Greenberg, but he wasn't the reason that I'm a Detroit Tiger fan. It was a guy who wasn't Jewish. He was a great pitcher at that time, Hal Neuhauser. And, uh, so by way of that, and now here's the gist of this, this poem, which is a piece of imagination about baseball. It was inspired by a man named Zebulon, Zeb, Red, they called him Red, Eaton, E-A-T-O-N. I think he was from North Carolina. And at that time in New York, talking about 1945, Joni Jatz was here, we beat, the, we beat the Cubs in the World <laughs> Series. Uh, but we won in 2016. <laughs> That's right, you did. Uh, in 45, it was known that only one man had ever hit a ball at Yankee Stadium that was hit into the upper deck of left field. That was Jimmy Fox of Boston. Well, this pitcher named Zebulon Red Eaton, who was a relief pitcher for Detroit, and I, I couldn't go to the game that day. It, was, it had started to rain and early on, and so I decided I'd listen to it on the radio. He was called in to pinch hit in the fifth inning of a game that the Tigers were playing the Yankees at Yankee Stadium. And he's a guy who hit the only other home run that was ever hit into the left field of Yankee Stadium. That's a huge shot, not merely for the length, but the height of it is incredible. Anyway, it inspired me to write The Big Gothic D, Arcane. It was published by Tisa Walden and Deep Forest Press. This is my only copy, though it was reprinted in the uh, big, uh, big fat Arcane's book of 2006 of a lot of my other long poems. But I'm going to read this now. I'll try this. I want to get comfortable reading this. 
Okay, yeah, here it goes. The big gothic D arcane, one. Around my heart, sewn on my uniform, the big gothic D. I run from the pen. I'm handed the ball on the mound. Warm up. It's always the top of the ninth inning. Two are on. There's one out. I see myself as if through a high-powered lens in the bleachers. Zoom in on myself from behind to put out the fire, the batter at the plate. This is how I've fallen to sleep most nights of my life. My father tongue, baseball. He led me to the Giants, the Yanks, the black Yankees at the stadium in Jim Crow days when the Yanks were on the road. Though my team was Detroit, the Tigers, and the war was raging on. All's different today. Hal Neuhauser could work 30 complete games then without need of a reliever. Arms weren't money. He never threw a pitch with nothing on it. Now, 83-year-old Zeb Eaton sits alone in a North Carolina parlor who pitched relief for Detroit in 45, his curve and all forgotten. His father taught him to throw, and outside on the porch, his great-grandson of five, Zeb Eaton III, is playing with a friend, as I did with Bugsy Benowitz on a Bronx stoop, pitching a pair of dice, as I did with my son David when he was likewise five years old. Snake eyes, a homer. Three, a triple. Four, a double. Five, a single. Six, a pop out. Seven, a strikeout or double play. Eight, a fly out. Nine, a ground out or sacrifice. Ten, a line out or triple play of two fives turn up with two or three runners on. Eleven, a walk, and twelve, a homer. In the ninth inning, with two men on, little Zeb calls for relief. <laughs> it's a twilight game. Now it's night. <laughs> the lights are on. Around my heart, sewn on my uniform, in this a dream time across space, I enter little Zeb's dice game. The players embodied, tall. I can do so, can see myself outside myself. Another Jack, helping the team. There's a war on. There's always a war on in America. I'm in there to strike out the Yanks, who are everywhere now and must be mowed down. I'm a tiger. I got Africa and Asian meat. The Yanks have the money, but we've the hunger, too. In sleep, as if dead under sod, I taste my son's tears, my father's, death's itself, the big DJ use. What's do be a go as now, be, uh, be who I overthrew and been overthrown by in the pinch, the clutch, who still ring me up without ringing, yet I hear every sign from the far deeper in hearing, like remembering all the Tigers on that 1945 World Series team, destining after destining, what a mound, what a swing, what a miss, this hard ball of a sorrow-stitched world packed with sisal by poor weeping women. I tell you, baby, in the light of all the killing taking place, I tell you, baby, for all the nothing being pitched in the game, I travel the world over and my gloves still sporting your name. Yeah, it's twilight, Ace, and the arcs come on animal soft. There's a flood of tears inside, 
but ain't no error at. Better call for the firemen, cause the bases are all jam-packed. Bring on the fire chief before your starter gets blasted. A triple play's needed to get out of this graveyard. Yeah, it's cold, black blues, thousands of miles away. It's ice cold shoes and the smell of the old world's hay. Only nine whistle do it or three in a double play. So call if you need me, though my eyes are an old hoot owls. Can't pick my corners, fastballs are losing power. While the Yanks go on crowing, we win, we rule, you die. We can cyber cloud digital RBIs. You can't catch up with speed and war together. Murderers row to dump you dead. Three. Only in can. Only in can win. Only incantation, as in no prison or grit streets, kicking time out of mind, out of one's mind. And the further in one goes to face inganting nothing, striding up to dig in, the more one lets God and lets go, the more the sun's the ball and hell one hell of an endgame strong. You're not simply for, but inside it, burning and bronzing in dark sun. It's the berries all night long, beginning again. That's the call, even with two strikes and a foul tip behind. Beginning the other beginning here and now, digging in because it's forbidden to be old. The light on the swing, on the miss. I'm the longing for home. The neck one wants to throttle and simultaneously kiss. The blonde cascade over the diamond, wet after rain. Leaves of that grass, that's your call. You're hot to get in there, show how your curve works, how sizzling your stuff, how the screwball you've developed takes off like a country woman in an untouchable huff. Strike one down the middle, necessary. Strike two's more, a solidarity up yours. Taft Hartley standing in. Now just one more, and you'll have the jam by the tail. One more, and it's three in your home. So you stretch wind all the years before you ever knew your nose, before a knot hole was your father's eye before there was the neon spectacle and a bat's heart still could be heard and you pour them into your pitch. And it's an ephus, an arc high over the diamond, a rainbow pache flag as if unfurling from the sky it's an ephus with wobbly stuff on, with surprise all over it, and the sound of the bat striking nothing but air under it as it crosses home is that hungry breeze cleaning the plate of all but night's sweet dreams. If I made the crowd name five famous baseball players, almost inevitably, he would be one of them. Okay? So let's try the experiment. Five famous baseball players. 
Lou Gehrig, somebody else? DiMaggio? Mickey Mantle. We didn't get to five. So um, all of the stories that I know about Mick are not the stories you know about Mick. I am related to him in, ev in almost every way you can be related to him without actually being genetically related. And it's going to sound funny, but my great uncle Larry married his only sister. And this whole passel of people who are my cousins are, you know, genetically related to him. And then um, on the other side of the family, he married somebody who's sort of related to me. It, you know, it's this huge, crazy web because small towns are like that. So I'm going to tell you a story. And I don't, I'm, it's actually a family story, but I wasn't there, OK? So you know how family stories are, right? There are family stories about the fact that Mick and Whitey Ford and um, Billy Martin used to come down to northeastern Oklahoma during the break time to hang out in Pitcher, Oklahoma, and used to visit my great-grandmother, who I knew very, very well. And there is a family story about what happened when Billy Martin spit on her floor. <laughs> he doesn't come out well in that story. <laughs> and then there's this story. And I like to tell it when somebody tells a story about how unkind Mick was to somebody who wanted an autograph or something. He was a very nice small town boy. OK, he really was. And he had some problems, but he was still a really nice small town boy. So the three of them, Mick, Whitey, and Billy, were coming to pick Marlon up from, I think, my great grandmother's house, actually, Marlon being his wife. And they drove by a fire that had started up. And the volunteer fire department of Pitcher, Oklahoma, was pouring water on this fire. But they weren't going to save the wood lot that had caught on fire. They were basically keeping it from spitting sparks <clears throat> and causing a prairie fire, which, if you've never seen, can be fairly impressive. All they're doing is pouring water on this fire. And they'd been doing it for some time. So as they're driving up to pick Marlin up, they see the cloud and they go, wonder what's going on. Let's go over this way, see what's going on. So they see them just pouring water on this fire. And it gets out of the car and goes up to the guy who's the, holding the hose and says, what's the deal? He goes, nothing. We're just, we can't put it out. It's going to have to burn out. But we're just trying to keep it under control so it doesn't get out of hand. And it goes, oh. And he looks at the guy and he goes, you look a little tired. How long have you been doing this? And the guy says, oh, it's been about five hours at this point. It's, it's been a while. And Mick goes, oh. He goes, well, so there's nothing skillful that has to happen here. The guy goes, no, nothing. He goes, well, I'll tell you what. And he pulls out his wallet and he gives him 50 bucks. And he says, take all the guys out to breakfast on me. And the three of us will stand here and finish putting out the fire. And I just want you for a moment to picture the look on the face of their coach. <laughs> if he had been there in that moment. So you've got three of the most important players on your team putting out a fire in northeastern Oklahoma for fun in the off season. <laughs> That's one of the stories I know about Mick. Baseball really does bring people together. And um, I was pretty excited about that, I've got to say. There are at least four different arcs of San Francisco poetry coming together in this room right now. Has to happen more often. And it was sort of my intention of a thing that I wanted to do as laureate this round. So I want to really thank you guys. I know it's really early, right? So here's the plan. There's a. There's a, a baseball installation upstairs on the sixth floor. <laughs> and it's really, really good. So I say we go upstairs and explore that 
and think lovely things about the baseball reliquary and Terry Cannon who made that possible. <laughs>